Yeah, we are live now. Started with the session? No, na? No, we'll just no. start. We have yeah, to share, the link, share the link. We yeah. got a break from that mental health thing for five minutes, so that's how we are joined. Okay. Got a break of five minutes. Good afternoon, Ashreka, ma'am. Good afternoon, Gitu. All the best. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, the link has been shared with the group members. Okay. We have one minute. Yeah. Achama, can I share the uh, this YouTube link in the SPND group? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. And also the TY students. Yeah. All of them, they are in this group, webinar group. Okay. Uh, shall we start, Asha ma'am? Yes, please go ahead. Good afternoon. On behalf of uh, IQAC and the Department of Human Development, Faculty of Home Science of Srimati P.N. Doshi Women's College, Mumbai, I extend a very warm welcome to our principal, Dr. Asha Menon, our resource person, Dr. Smita Desai, Dr. Rekha Randiwe, from the, the vice principal of faculty of home science, and our faculty members from our college and all the different colleges, and our dear participants from Mumbai and different states of India. The title for today's webinar is Vision NEP 2020, Outlining Horizons for Equitable and Inclusive Education. At the outset, I would like to invite our dynamic principal, Dr. Asha Menon, to address the participants. Over to you, Asha. Thank you, Dr. Shobha. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on Vision NEP 2020, Outlining Horizons for Equitable and Inclusive Education organized by IQAC and Department of Human Development, Shimati P. N. Roshi Women's College, Mumbai. I would like to introduce my colleague first. Our institution is 61 years old. We have been recognized as one of the top performing institutes in the country by NAC in 2017. The vision of our institution is to educate, enlighten, and empower girls. Well-qualified and dedicated teachers excellent teaching and learning process, student support like mini lunch, clothes bank and book bank, good governance, leadership and management, and best practices like IQAC and academic and administrative audit have helped us achieve what we have today. All these have culminated not only in getting high grades in NAC, but also in fulfilling our vision to be recognized as a center of excellence for education that empowers women, leading to self-actualization. Coming back to today's webinar, yes, education is the greatest tool for achieving social justice and equality. Inclusive and equitable education is critical to achieving an inclusive and equitable society in which every citizen has the opportunity to free, thrive, and contribute to the nation. In our institution, we have an inclusive a policy which attracts students from all strata of the society. I'm happy to say that the National Education Policy 2020 attempts to address the growing inequality. This policy reaffirms that bridging the social category gaps in access, 
participation and learning outcomes in education will continue to be one of the major goals of all education sector development programs. To ensure equality and inclusion, the policy proposes decisive and comprehensive action on all fronts. A commitment to improve and expand public education, address the causes of exclusion, and actions for the inclusion of specific disadvantaged groups will go a long way in providing equitable and inclusive education for all. I would like to specially welcome the resource person for today's webinar, Dr. Smita Desai, who will help us understand this topic better. I would also like to welcome the principals, vice principals, teachers and students and participants to this webinar. I'm happy to see such an overwhelming response from the participants. I am told there are more than 400 participants in this webinar from seven different states of our country. Wishing the webinar the very best, and I congratulate the IQAC team and the Department of Human Development for organizing such a relevant webinar. Thank you. Over to Dr. Shobha Bharat for further proceedings. Thank you, ma'am. I would now like to invite Dr. Ritu Bhatia to give the concept note of the webinar. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Shobha Bharat. Thank you, Principal Ma'am, for your kind words. Good afternoon, each and everyone present here on this bright Thursday afternoon here at Mumbai. I, Dr. Ritu Bhatia, on behalf of IQAC and Department of Human Development of Srimati P.N. Doshi Women's College is happy to welcome all the dignitaries and participants for national level webinar on topic Vision NEP 2020, outlining thousands for equitable and inclusive education. Education needs a greater focus on accessibility, equity, and quality. National education policy aims to ensure equity and inclusion in and through education by addressing all forms of exclusion, disparity, and inequality. In education, assess, participation, retention, completion, and also in learning outcomes. The latest educational national education policy 2020 attempts to address the growing inequality and inequity which is upsetting country's education system today. The policy recognizes children with special needs and believes in incorporating them into the mainstream education systems. It broadly aligns with the objectives of the Rights of Persons with Disability Act 2016. NEP also aims to recruit special educators in all school complexes to make sure that teaching is more inclusive and cognizant of the needs of special needs children. It has also proposed that children with benchmark disabilities will be allowed to opt for home schooling and would be provided with skilled home schooling educators. Further, it is significant to know that teachers will be trained to identify learning disabilities in children early and to help such children to succeed in education. NEP also proposes that National Assessment Center, PARAK, will be formulated to create equitable systems of assessment for children with learning disabilities. NAP recommends to set up special educational zones to region with significant population belonging to socio-economically disadvantaged groups. NAP 2020 also recognizes that certain groups are grossly underrepresented in the existing educational systems to specifically address their educational needs. The NEP has clubbed gender identities, socio-cultural identities, geographical identities, all sorts of disability and socio-economic conditions to create this kind of setup. To keep all this in mind, we had planned this webinar on Vision NEP 2020. We ish, wish to inform everyone present here that the Human Development Department of Srimati P. N. Doshi Women's College has papers on special needs children at both BSc and BA level. With the aim to understand more on the NEP policy framework, 
on special needs individual we had decided to plan national level webinar with this we wish to develop an analytical perception in students and others other stakeholders about nep with reference to various disabilities we are sure that this would help us to develop better understanding about how we who are in the human development area and other professions could contribute in implementing nep by making a conducive and inclusive environment for children with disabilities at our centers schools colleges and at university i am happy to say that we have got huge registration from students faculties professionals working in the field of special education and others for this webinar as principal ma'am has already mentioned that we have got participation from different states of india so we are very happy to welcome each and every one for today's webinar with this i dr ritu bhatia as a convener of this national level webinar welcome each and every one for today's event i wish that all the participants who are attending today's webinar may develop better insight into nep 2020 and also we can motivate the girls the young students the young minds to work for special needs children thanks all of you welcome all of you over to dr shobha bharat thank you ritu i would like to introduce our very well endowed resource person dr smita desai who is for the session today dr smita desai has contributed in the areas of psychology and special needs since 1986 she holds a phd degree in applied psychology from mumbai university and a m.ed degree with credits in learning disabilities and behavior disorders from north carolina state university usa she is the founder director of drishti an organization in mumbai since 1994 and it was also set up uh, in bangalore since 2014 drishti is an organization working in the space of psychology special needs and inclusion since 1994 it provides a spectrum of services including psychodiagnostics school counseling therapies school leadership training teacher training online certificate courses and capacity building programs in the area of psychology and inclusive education drishti has demonstrated accomplishment in the spheres of mental health inclusion and education management for 30 plus years dr desai is currently engaged in leadership training for school principals teacher training programs for inclusion trauma counseling for individuals and schools parent awareness and school enrichment program programs she is presently on the board of studies of sophia college for women and shrimati manimen mp shah women's college mumbai she represents drishti on health consortium committee iit mumbai gender equality human rights and the inclusion of women and persons with disabilities in education workspaces sports and politics are of are areas of deep interest and engagement she has conducted leadership and teacher training programs in the area of inclusion for more than 100 educational institutions across india and uae she is the lead faculty on, in the online certification training programs and workshops conducted by drishti pan india thank you so much ma'am for sparing your valuable time and joining us today now the floor is all yours thank you so much ma'am thank you thank you everyone um dr shobha for inviting me and all the other dignitaries thank you so much it's absolutely a pleasure and an honor to be here and thank you for the wonderful introduction also um it's really very satisfying to know that we have so many participants online and um i do hope that there are some good takeaway messages for um you know for this very very i think important topic to us as you know society as a whole and um yes i do hope that you know we we can um give to our future generation of citizens um the very important you know aspects of inclusion understanding diversity and how each one of them can contribute to this particular aspect of growth yeah 
So, um, Dr. Shobha, while I while I take um, you know a couple of minutes to share screen and load my um, you know load my presentation on uh, participants, a very warm welcome. And I am going to ask you to do a little bit and get yourself prepped for this um, session. So, you know, I just want you to grab maybe a newspaper or a magazine or something that is lying around you in the house. Keep that with you and just keep a pen with you, all right? A pen and a blank sheet of paper or a line sheet of paper. I'm going to give you a minute or so just to quickly do that while I load my presentation, okay? So, our, um, our interaction today is not going to be a one-way interaction. I don't believe in that. Um, it is going to be both ways yes because that's the only way I know that you can take away something which is of use I can't you know you probably will get less bored that way um, so while I'm loading this on get yourself a newspaper or a magazine a sheet of paper that you can write on and a pencil or a pen right in the meantime let me load my presentation Dr. Shoma yeah Dr. Shobha, you just need to confirm for me that um, the screen is now visible. Yes, yes, yes. Yes? Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. So, um, students, teachers, whatever, whoever are the participants, I'm just going to call all of you learners today. Yeah. So, let's start with the topic for today, which is Vision NEP, Outlining Horizons for Equitable and Inclusive Education. Um, the organization that I have uh, had found and I'm still a part of, that is Rishti, has always been a very strong advocate of inclusion, of diversity, and of course, you know, everything that goes with it, that is equality, equitability, etc. Uh, we've been trying um, in our own little way to be a part of the community, um, and to do that, we have you know, being a part of the school community because I strongly believe that if we want to make any long-term change in society, um, we must begin when children are very young, okay? And so a good place to be able to make or to begin such a change will be in schools, right? And what schools allow you to do is they allow you to reach out to a large number of people, which are not just children, but all stakeholders. So it could be teachers, it could be parents, it could be school authorities, it could be school administrators, all of them, right? And you as students are probably going to be a part um, in the workforce, in the schools, higher education colleges, universities, probably at some point of your career. So going forward with the mindset of inclusion is a very good place to start off with, right? So, um, Dr. Desai, I'm sorry yes. to interrupt, but there is some disturbance uh, from- Not, not on my side. end, Dr. Shobha. Not at your end? No, this is somewhere else. Okay. <laughs> Someone okay, else I'm is sorry. not on mute. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, all right. So, um, what I'm going to do is, um, first, let me share the agenda for you to, with you today. Okay. So the agenda is four point. All right, and that is let us get to understand what is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Okay. Before that. Right? We're talking about the national education policy and it would be a good idea if you haven't gone through, you know, like a summary of it. I don't expect you to go through the whole thing. It's, it's a lot, right? But I mean, if you can and, you know, probably cover it over a period of days, that's great. But I would say locate a summary, right? And you would get an idea about 
what are all the different components and therefore also you know where does inclusive education fit into it right so what i have done is for today's session what i'm trying to do is to be able to engage you okay in an understanding of what is inclusion um how is it going to be a part of this policy and more than anything how are you as i would say foot soldiers on the ground um how are you going to execute this how are you going to help um you know how are you going to enable educational institutions to be able to make themselves more inclusive more equitable so this these are the four points basically that i'm going to be talking to you about right some some points will be more expansive some will be less expansive and i've tried to add in a few activities here so the first point is let's understand what's diversity equity and inclusion what is now these known as dei and then what are equitable classrooms what do they look like right and then what is inclusive education and last and final we come to then putting together all these fundamentals so that you understand what is equitable and inclusive education within the framework of the nep dr ritu also gave you some pointers and i'm going to be able to expand on that okay so let's get going okay so i'm going to start off first with an activity all right and what i need you to do is um you know have a look at this okay and i want you to just think how are these three pictures same and different right so that's my that's the first reflection that i want you to do how are these three pictures same and different you might have seen these on the net or you might have seen these somewhere that's fine okay the activity we are going to do is what's important so what's same and different and second thing what might be three captions that you therefore give these three pictures right let's assume that the first picture is of those three boxes and each of the students standing on one box that is picture 1 picture 2 is with the multiple boxes and picture 3 is with no boxes okay so i first want you to reflect to yourself what is same and different between these pictures but what i want you to be able to put in chat is captions for picture 1 picture 2 picture 3 so the way you put it in chat is 1 what is your caption 2 what is your caption 3 what is your caption i don't want a caption more than couple of words or three words at the most you know word or a phrase right and i repeat picture 1 is with the three boxes where all the students are standing on a box picture 2 is with the multiple boxes which is in the middle and picture 3 is students standing on no boxes right so um why don't i give you uh, about 30 seconds and then you can start using the chat yeah and i'll be looking out for you in chat ma'am uh, i'm getting the responses on youtube may i please read them out to you okay uh so we have uh, sana anis who says okay. that the middle picture represents equity okay so you know what just give me uh just give it uh, shobha just give it a minute yeah uh because i'm also looking at the chat okay okay let stuff come on the chat uh dr shobha and then i'll take it from you yeah? uh, actually like most of the participants ma'am are uh, watching this webinar on youtube youtube okay so then can we just give it a little bit of time like yes, know, so yes. that everyone can kind of you know have a little bit of thinking space yes, and maybe once you get a little more then you can you can tell me yeah
Okay, so Shobha, do you have enough to start off with? Sorry, I forgot I was on mute. The following are the responses. Yes. So there is a, the middle is an example of equity. Then okay. somebody says equity with equality. Okay. Uh, Shilpa says equality, equity, and inclusion. Uh, come again, come again. Equa equity. So you're saying picture one, picture two, picture three. Yes. Equality, equity, and inclusion. Then okay. we have uh, Mariposa who is saying picture one is equality. Picture two is equity and three is freedom and inclusivity. Okay. Uh, many responses are coming as middle one is equality. Okay, equality. Okay. Yes. And uh, okay. Anaswara says number picture number one is equity. Okay. Okay. And then she says uh, equality for all. Okay. Equity for all and freedom and inclusivity or liberation. Then okay. we have, uh, in the second picture, they have adjusted the heights according to the needs. So again, yes. that is the equality. Okay. Third picture says equality and inclusion. Uh, many of them are giving responses as picture two is inclusive and equality. Uh -huh. Inclusive and equality, okay. Yes, then we have equity, equality and inclusion. Mm -hmm. And uh, someone... Tanu Kumar says they are in the same stage, but there are they are at different levels, okay. and many many responses as to second one is equality. Equality. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for helping out, Dr. Shobha. That really, I mean, kind of put away my need to be, you know, going through chat and you know all of that, right? Thank you so much. So from what I hear, um, Dr. Shobha, if I'm not mistaken, what you've said is that a lot of people have given the second picture, the middle picture, as as talking about equality, right? Uh, of course, there are some who said equality is the first picture, equity is the second, um, freedom, etc., etc., is the third, right? Okay. So let's look at let's look at you know what does what does research tell us and what are the different concepts, so to say, right? So just to clarify, okay, and that's where that's where the concepts, you know, understanding of the concepts comes in, right? So the first picture, which some of them said was equality, is what it is. Um, why? Okay, it's important because a lot of people have said the middle picture is equality, right? But, you know, it's, it's also a lot of understanding of the language that is used. But to understand that the linguistic concepts that are being applied is so that, you know, we can actually give names. We can understand, you know, what is really happening. All right. In reality, whatever is happening, we're trying to put down language to suit that so that we can then give the proper resources be justified. Right. So in the meantime, I'm sure you've read this. Let me explain it to you. Right. So the first picture actually depicts equality. Why does it depict equality? It's not depicting equality of the people. It's depicting equality from the supports and the resources that are being provided to the person. So as people in any group, we will always be heterogeneous. If you have heard and read about the normal curve, you know, in psychological studies, there is something which is known as a normal curve. And in that we say that, you know, on an average 60% or so of people kind of you know are placed around the average and then the rest are you know on this side on the right side of the curve and the left side of the curve with some deficits and advantages and etc right however because people are different when they come into a situation they may or may not be able to avail of the same advantages okay so like for example we may all you know um, like these three students here right and they want to be watching this match, but one is lesser in height, which is a very natural phenomenon, right? Now, equality is ensuring that all of them get the same kind of support in order to be able to benefit, right? But as you can see, this equal treatment is not proving to be enough. So, say the boy, you know, the taller boy in the blue trousers, probably doesn't need this support. Whereas 
the boy in the yellow shorts, the girl in the yellow shorts, needs additional support. And that's what is equity. Equity means that I get the support that I need because my needs are different, right? But if A, B, and C have to avail of the same benefits, then they will need the help and the assistance and the support that is customized for them, right? Like for example, very simple. I'm wearing glasses, right? So are probably 200 other people on this on this platform. Do we, are we going to wear glasses with the same power in the lenses? No, because my needs are different. So the support I get or the support I will ask for will be different, right? And that support that I need to get is equity, right? And then, of course, is justice. What are they saying in justice? Look at the pictures, right? So that's why I asked you to reflect. What's same? What's different? In the three pictures, the three kids are all the same kids. But the supports that they are being given is different. And if you see the last picture, that is known as justice or what someone said, liberation. Of, it's liberation from the barriers. It's freedom from the barriers. It's justice because you're getting access, right? And what? What is it? Why is it justice? Because all these three kids are able to get a benefit, okay, without any support or accommodation. Because the cause of the inequity, which was your wooden fence, okay, that barrier itself, the cause of the inequity has been addressed. And therefore, we have a fence. But it's someone which everyone can look through, right? So here, this was a systemic barrier, or what we call a physical barrier, an infrastructural barrier, which has been removed. And the inequity has been addressed, due to which none of these individuals require any additional support or accommodation. Now, this is not what happens. I mean, this is not easy to happen in reality, right? However, that is what we're aiming for. First, we're definitely aiming for equality. But many a times that equality is not enough. So then the, the best that we want to aim for is equity. But even better than equity is actually addressing the systemic barriers. Because if we remove the systemic barriers, we are, we are trying to shape a society which will be barrier free and therefore will be fair and equitable and therefore with justice for absolutely everyone. Okay? Now, I want you to be able to remember and understand these fundamental concepts. Okay? If there's anything I want you to take home today, it's not just the NEP. I want you to take home some of these basic concepts. Okay? What they are, what differentiates them so that tomorrow when you're walking on the road and you see people you know from different disadvantaged groups facing certain barriers you should be able to recognize is there first of all equality then is there equity can there be justice okay these are the questions that you should be asking yourself on a daily basis okay all right let's go on so, before we move any further, I'm going to do a quick read over of the definitions of, you know, this put together uh, concept of DEI. And DEI stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion. So, diversity means understanding that each individual, that is you, me, and everyone else is unique, and recognizing their individual differences. I'm going to add one more word here. And that is not only really recognizing the individual differences. I think diversity is about accepting differences. Okay. And yesterday, in fact, I was uh, on a program on school mental health on Instagram Live, and um, with the host, you know, who had invited me. Um, that's what we were talking about. We were talking about diversity, and diversity is not just of gender and socioeconomic status and race and geography and language and religion. No. There is diversity of thought, 
of wants, of needs, just between two people living in a house, between family members living in a house. And therefore, what is our tolerance threshold for this diversity is what is important, okay? And, and if, you, if you try and think about it, most of our conflicts, today when you read the newspaper, whether you hear about governance, at the basis of it is the low threshold of tolerance for diversity, that is for differences. If, as a global society, we can respect each other's differences and through that respect accept it, then I think we are on the right path. Okay, yeah. Okay. So, um, next is equity, okay? Um, equity in education, for example, is achieved when students are all treated the same and have access to similar resources. Okay, that's one part of it, that's equality, right? But equity is achieved when all students receive the resources they need so that they can graduate prepared for success after high school. I mean, you're all, you're all students in college, right? How are you going to graduate? Are you all prepared for the next pathway that you're going to take? Has your college, your educational institution provided you resources which in a way has equalized the benefits that you can get, right? That's equity, okay? And inclusion, inclusion is, you know, inclusion, inclusive education is now seen uh, from a human rights lens, okay? Um, that means it is a universal human right, okay? So the aim of inclusion is to embrace all people irrespective of race, gender, ability, disability, medical, whatever, right? So together, when you put DEI together, um, you know, in this diversity is often perceived to be about perspective, representation, some tough conversation, and supportive of inclusion, inclusion of diversity, basically. Inclusion prompts answers about creating environments which are conducive to feedback, supporting diversity and being open. If we talk about being equitable, we're talking about being fair, same, etc. Now, for example, okay, um, I mean, I don't know, I, I think I may be having mostly a large number of women on this platform today, right? And as you know, you know, when, when women get married and get into a new family and a new household, there are a lot of changes that come about in our lives. And one of the first things that we strive is, um, you know, in our marital relationship, um, that there that should be equality, right? We, we want it. We would like to expect it, and we want that equality. But we are different genders, and therefore our biological systems, our psychological systems, our socio-cultural systems are really different, right? Um, and so, shouldn't we be asking for a more equitable relationship? rather than just an equal relationship. Because an equal relationship can be so between two people who are more or less equal, right? But I mean, how many of us are equal? So I strongly believe that we should aim for equity, yeah? Uh, because I feel equity is then fairness, sameness, value, diversity, and inclusion, right? So like I said, these are things that I want you to go back home, reflect upon it. And all these are concepts which are not there only in the NEP. They're not there only for us to study education and psychology. It's there to be applied in daily life. Okay, and when you start applying it in daily life is when you're going to be able to help yourself and help others, right? So there can be diversity of people and perspectives. There can be equity in policy, practice and position. There can be inclusion via power, voice, and organizational culture, and of course, justice with equal rights and equitable opportunities, right? So I do want you to go home understanding all these different 
concepts. Okay. So once we do that is when we can start, you know, once we understand what's diversity, equality, equity, inclusion, justice, etc. is when we can start putting it into action. Okay. Before we go into equitable classrooms, um, do we have equitable homes? Right? Because I believe every thought process, every conversation, every dialogue, begins at home, right? And if that's not happening at home, um, it's going to be a little difficult to start it in the classroom, right? But still, I'm never too late. So, you know, classrooms is also somewhere we need to find a community. It's a collaborative community. And therefore, you know, that's also where it can start. But do, you know, do put that question down for yourself. Um, uh, is my home equitable? Does it support equality? Does it support equity? Um, what's, what's the gender balance like? Is it powered? Is it gendered at home? What is it like? Okay, because those are the thought processes. Those is you know those are the cultural orientations that we're going to take into our classrooms. So I want you to do a little um, a little activity. Um, Dr. Shobha, will you also be able to help me on the feedback on this? Yes, yes, definitely. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so people, let me start with this little activity. Um, what I want you to do is, I want you all to close your eyes, but I don't want you to fall asleep, okay? Uh, we just have a little time there. So what I want you to do is, I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to think, if you're students, okay, how do you like your classroom to be? How do you like your professor, your teacher to be? What would you like the teaching to be like? Okay. You can put down a few, few points in the chat and Dr. Shoma will probably help me out with that, right? So yes. what are your needs as a student? How do you how would you like your classroom to be? How would you like your professor to be? What do you want your teaching to be like? You know, by what do you want your teaching by pedagogy? I mean, you know, do you like, would you like it to be narratives? Would you like to be videos? Do you want to be doing some journal and blog reading? You know, would you like to have some field trips? Hopefully now that this pandemic is, we're not going into another third and fourth wave. You know, what, what would you want it to be like, right? So then just put down a few thoughts on chat for me. Dr. Shobha, once we have a few, maybe you can start uh, reading yes. that out. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, ma yeah. And you can call me Shobha. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So have we got anything? Yes, we have got uh, a feedback from Sana saying visuals, auditory okay. stimulation. Okay, so we would want visual and auditory stimulation in the classroom. Okay, anything on how we want our teachers to be, our professors to be? Somebody says, Asana herself says assignments. Okay. All right, so my next question to everyone is, how would you want your professor to be? Friendly, they are saying. Uh, when they are talking about classroom should be colorful, teachers to be presentable. She okay. should be at the children's level. Classes okay. should be active and interactive. Okay. Uh, we have people say, uh, Pratyush who says good infrastructure, advanced technology. Right, right, great. Sana yeah. is also saying kinesthetic. And okay. uh, we have uh, Gargi who is saying that there should be no discrimination among the students. There should okay. be activities for holistic development. Teachers okay. should be friendly. She should be a mentor. Okay. Teachers to actively interact with their children, create a positive environment for their students, support learning and ensure understanding of the curriculum rather than speeding it, says Gargi. 
Okay. Then we have uh, somebody says understanding hands-on activities. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shobha. Friendly okay. and happy eye contact. Mm -hmm. Who makes eye contact? Okay. Colorful All classrooms right. and friendly teachers. So uh, okay. quite a lot of feedback is coming. Okay. Thank I have I have my next part of the activity. Okay. So participants, I'm going to flip this around for you. Okay. And I'm asking you. Tomorrow, if you were teachers in the classroom, you were professors in the classroom, right? How, how do you see yourself? Okay. How would you like to make your classrooms? How do you see yourself? Okay. Wanting to be and how do you see your classroom? When you are a professor or a teacher in the classroom, how do you see this? Sarah sees herself as friendly, understanding okay. and interacting with all the students. Okay. Sana says she'll be open to teamwork. All right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Super cool, positive vibes, friendly conversations. <laughs> ah, friendly conversations. Good, good, good. Okay. Being the inspiration have, to students. I have another thought for you. Okay. Let's suppose you're in the classroom, school, college, whatever. And there are about three to four students in your classroom of around 50 or 40 or 50 kids. Three or four of them have different, have special educational needs, right? So maybe you've got someone who's got a difficulty in writing, someone who can't do their math well, someone who's got some features of autism, someone who's very attention deficit, very hyperactive, right? How would you manage? What would you do when you've got different people in your classroom? with different needs and very distinctly different and special needs. What would you do? Give me just one or two words. What would you do? Think of all the things which you said you do, right? You'd be friendly, you'd be interactive, you'd be caring, you would be Justifiable. Come on, take take your cues from there. Give individual attention and guidance. Okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. Tell me what else? Friendly and encouraging. encouraging. Approachable. Okay. Uh, Lata says uh, that she will make them uh, keep them close to her. Okay. Uh, first, Damini says first she will understand them. Mm -hmm. Personal assistance, uh, being okay. patient, grouping okay. them according to their level of learning. Yes. Uh, provide support, material resources required by them and ensure that the rest of my class also understands and supports their classmate. Right. Right. Empathetic, right. individual attention, patience, approachable. Those are all the... Okay, so I, I like I like what someone said about not only am I going to try and understand and work with the child, but I also try and make sure that those around me, those around the child in the classroom would also be there to support this child, right? And I think that's the mindset of developing an inclusive community, okay? Uh, because the NEP, amongst the other laws and whatever, whatever, also puts forth as to how it is now going to be mandatory to mainstream all children. That means give them the opportunity to attend regular schools. And if we have to do that, then we're going to have to create inclusive communities, which no matter what, how many schools say they are inclusive, believe in you, they're not really inclusive. You go to so many, so many schools, 
that you want to do a litmus test of inclusivity okay you simply go and stand outside the front entrance of the school and there's one thing you need to look for and that is does the school have a ramp okay a ramp a ramp is just like stairs you have that slope right the slope is something the slope and the railings with it is something that is required for individuals who may be in a wheelchair whatever that is your first marker just as you stand outside an institution people can say whatever they want about inclusion okay being being inclusive and whatever whatever this is your litmus test you go you see a building you see a school you see a college and if you see the ramp there then you've got hope but if you don't then there may be a lot of other things that you're talking about but some basic fundamentals is not there okay so these are some of the things that again i need you to reflect upon there are no easy answers and there is no no ready solutions right we've got to find them ourselves right so like it says here you know um the biggest mistake of past centuries in teaching has been to treat all children as if they were variants of the same individual and thus to feel justified in teaching them the same subjects in the same ways okay and these are words of howard gardner who you know is the father of the theory of multiple intelligences in psychology right and um, you know little graphic cartoon over there which says that you know um, for a fair selection everybody has to take the same exam and climb that tree right but that is what we're doing right when you actually see it out there how you will have all these animals including the elephant and the goldfish and whatever climb the tree but that's what we're expecting in our schools in our institutions of higher education we have almost the same examination and we're expecting everyone to take it in the same way now it's when we start bringing in modifications etc etc is when we are you know making it equitable now for example when we talk just about equality right we are giving the same paper to everyone as equality is that fair is that justifiable it's not right so equality is understood and it's good in you know for a, for a number of things but after a point it doesn't serve the purpose you have to move to a more equitable system okay yeah okay so i have a question here for you what is an equitable classroom okay what do you understand as being an equitable classroom so what i'd like you to do is i don't want you to give me a statement i just want you to put down maybe one word or a phrase of three words or two words which in your mind tells you you know if i'm asking a question what is an equitable classroom you will say this 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 or just this makes an equitable classroom right so let me get some words from you dr shobha uh, if you'll help me please yes yes most definitely so what is an equitable classroom give me some give me some words to Answer this question. One word, three word phrases. Don't give me anything more. Dominic says safe. Safe, okay. So I'm going to start. You know, safe. I'm going to start I'm putting the. Yeah, so an equitable classroom is a safe classroom. Okay. What else, Shubha? Child friendly. So an equitable classroom is a child friendly classroom okay. comfortable it's comfortable equitable classroom is a comfortable classroom okay what else respected and included irrespective of age and gender sana say so an equitable classroom is one which offers the same benefits irrespective of gender and whatever it's right yes okay. equity happens when all students are respected and included regardless of their background or abilities 
respected and included okay all right what else a group working accommodable group working so an equitable classroom is a group working but a group working can even an inequitable classroom can be group working or an accommodative classroom right so whenever we are answering a question what is an equitable classroom an equitable classroom is one where the students feel respected and included regardless of their differences right yes. i mean i'm just putting together what everyone has said right and it's not just respected and included i think what is also an equitable classroom is this okay classrooms are equitable when all students have access to grade appropriate intellectually challenging curriculum and productive equal status interactions with peers and the teacher so we're talking about material resources we're talking about human resources and human resource interaction both with the teacher and with the peers okay so there's a lot that comes into equitability it's not just a feeling of respect and inclusion how are we going to make it operational how are we going to make it concrete what is it that i can see what is it that i am getting okay and that is access one of the biggest words in terms of inclusion is access access to everything all children must have access to great appropriate material to challenging curriculum to be productive to equal status interactions with their own peers with the children with the teachers it should not be that because i have a disability or i have a learning issue that i should be considered or given less opportunities than another child who has no disabilities okay because at least i must be given fair opportunity how i perform will depend on my individualized abilities but at least i must have access to opportunity okay and that is something that the system is responsible that's a systemic responsibility yeah second classrooms are equitable when students and teachers recognize different intellectual abilities and they define intelligence as being flexible incremental and multidimensional and that's what howard gardner's multiple intelligence is all about but different types of intelligences right and then you have the fluid and the crystallized intelligence and this can be flexible this can move up and down this can apply itself differently in different situations right and uh, students and teachers need to recognize that also all students in equitable classrooms have multiple opportunities and varied ways to demonstrate the intellectual competence and way of being smart in the subject right so i don't know if you've heard of this is things like uh, the universal design of learning differentiated instruction these are different frameworks of education frameworks of instruction and these allow for multiple opportunities these allow for various ways to demonstrate okay and last classrooms are equitable when the distribution of achievement measures is narrowed and clustered around an acceptable mean okay that means what do we mean by that okay distribution of achievement measures so you know how what are we using to assess the child what are we understanding from the outcomes and this needs to you know go come as close to the uh, you know kind of get everyone as close as possible together right so our means of assessment needs to be such a way that it's possible for everyone to do this assessment right it should not be impossible for someone to do it and that's how we need to come close to it right so these are some of the some very important characteristics of an equitable and inclusive classroom one and the most important accessibility to the instructor so i remember one of the participants saying as a teacher i will keep children close to me yes so in a physical manner that's what it is right so the instructor needs to be physically and cognitively and mentally and psychologically accessible to the children right there needs to be a flexible and inclusive syllabi what do we mean by flexible 
we mean that there are children across the spectrum, right? So you, I mean, spectrum of intelligence, spectrum of abilities. So you have children with disabilities, and then you've got those really intelligent children, you know, cognitively intelligent children. And sometimes they also find classrooms challenging because they don't have something which is suitable to their really sharp, you know, working minds, right? So we've got to have syllabus, which is flexible, which can go either ways, and also which is inclusive. We need to have classrooms which can foster a diversity viewpoint, a foster diversity viewpoint and mindset. Not just accept, not to say, okay, we've got five different people, different abilities, different languages. Okay, we're accepting them and putting them together. No, we're saying foster a diversity mindset, right? All right, there's something same, something is different. How can we make things interesting, challenging? How can we treat this diversity as capital? Okay, how can we capitalize on this diversity and make it a better environment for everyone? That is fostering a diversity mindset. Okay, facilitate discussions where all students can participate. So you might have students with a visual impairment, with a hearing impairment, with a motor impairment. How are you going to, what are you going to do so that all students can participate, right? Those are the things that are required. You honor the differences and the similarities. And then, you know, have some guidelines which are, you know, what we call the ground rules, right? Um, it's an interesting fact given by research that when teachers set ground rules for the classroom, they should do it on day two of the when the new term starts. The first day, spend enough time building rapport. And the next day, you've got your ground rules down so that you don't have different people behaving in all different ways, which can be disrespectful, undignified, etc. Right? So you want to have dignity, you want to have human rights, you want to have respect in your classroom, right? Because you as a teacher is responsible for growing citizens, right? Next, access. And access, again, active, uh, you know, it's an access, accessibility. Again, access to quality education, technology, teaching. Again, one of the participants spoke about technology, and that's going to be such an important part of education. Already is, right? Provision of a variety of ways to respond. That means as a teacher and practicing what we preach, right? So there's an entire course on differentiated instruction as a framework that we at Rishti are offering on you know, our online education platform. We have an online education platform known as Prabhav, okay? If you get onto the internet, prabhav.education. And we offer, you know, these short-term certification courses. We also offer toolkits. Uh, we have a certification course um, on differentiated instruction, right? And differentiated instruction does exactly this. It provides a variety, it, 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 uh, it trains you as a teacher to provide a variety of ways to respond to a heterogeneous classroom. So now let's come to what do we understand by inclusive education. Okay, people get your magazines ready, your newspapers ready, we're going to do an activity, right? The first activity is this. I want you to quickly start reading, okay? I want you to read these colors to yourself, but I don't want you to read the blue as a blue. I want you to read it in the color in which it is printed. So, not yellow, but green. Not blue, but red. Not orange, but blue. You get me? Okay? And I'm counting from 1 to 10 and tell me, at the end of it, you're going to tell me how many you got right. Okay, I'm starting. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Stop. Come on. Give me your, give me your numbers. How many did you get right? We've got, um, we've got 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 14. Come on. Tell me how many of them did you get them right? And you can put them up there and Dr. Shobha will tell me the numbers. How many did you, you know, read right as per the color? Yes, they are telling me the, num the names of the colors, but how many? Did yeah, they how many right? did they get them right? 
So sana and I I don't remember the other names. Come on, tell me how many did you five. write? Somebody five. Somebody said five. Okay. Payoshni Joshi says five. Somebody five. says twelve. Sana says okay. twelve. Prupti wow. says five. Miss okay. Ma says nine. Rati okay. Devi says. Uh, just a moment. Yeah. Yes. Rima says five. eleven. Lata okay. says nine. Okay. Somebody said fourteen on fourteen. Who is this? Pratyush Parmar. Yes. Okay, Pratyush, got it. Okay, now this. There are two takeaways, two or three takeaways from this activity. Okay, one. When you actually start doing it, it's not easy. Okay, so it's like your eyes are asking. You know, your eyes are looking at something, but your brain is giving you different directions, and it's not easy. So although I have given that one instruction for everyone, but someone got five right, someone got fourteen right, someone got eleven right, someone got nine right, right? How come? Because all our neurological systems kind of work at a different pace. So although we are all given the same instructions, we are given the same resources. That's equality, but our performance, our outcome, will be as per our own unique neurological system and who's to say what is good or bad finally at the end of it the person over five will read the 14 just needs a little more time is that something so bad can we not give some extra time right this is what tells you uh, by the way uh, technically it's known as the stroop test okay s-t-r-o-o-p the stroop test and um, it's, a, it's, it's a neurobiological uh, test, okay? Uh, anyway, the purpose is different, but I just put that down for you to understand that we may all get the same stimuli, but our responses will vary because of the unique neurobiological systems that we have, okay? And thus a need to be inclusive and allow for that extra time, or maybe someone needs a bigger font, or maybe someone needs to stand back and read it, whatever, right? But we're all capable of doing it, and we might even need some help to do it. But you know, the needs are different, and we need to be inclusive, right? Okay, so when we talk about inclusion, there are also three other terms, fundamental terms that you need to know, right? So when we talk about the journey of inclusion, we actually came about you know, look at these pictures, right? So the other three terms which are actually related to inclusion and in the journey of inclusion actually came this way. Exclusion, segregation, integration, and inclusion. Let me put that as an applied understanding of concepts. So let's say, you know, for example, you've got children with maybe visual impairments, right? That's a disability. Now, earlier there would be complete exclusion and maybe in a lot of, uh, you know, areas which are rural areas, etc., you still have exclusion. So, for example, many of these children with cognitive disabilities, visual disability, won't reach any school. You know, they probably just get, you know, they're denied access to education in any form. That is exclusion. Okay. Then, then came about what are known as and are still present special schools. So you have different schools for um, students who are visually impaired, hearing impaired, cognitively impaired, right? And so you have regular schools where children without these disabilities, so to say the normal children go to school. And then you have these special schools, okay? Like you can see the little yellow circle there, right? And that is segregation. That happens when, you know, students um, are provided education in separate environments which are designed to be used or to, you know, respond to various different impairments, right? So they're segregated if they're given education in different environments. And then we have integration, okay? Where is where a lot of our schools are today and they call themselves inclusive, but they're not because in integration, you're placing the children with different disabilities in a classroom full of children without disabilities. So you may have a, a child with visual impairment, a child with hearing impairment, you may have a child with cognitive impairment, all in the same class. But 
they're not being given <clears throat> equitable resources that they can be a part of the entire group. So inevitably, they still get segregated or separated. So they stay in the same physical environment, or they may even be sent out to the special educator's resource room, and they spend a lot of their daytime over there. Uh, <clears throat> so let me tell you, you know, when I visited the United States about two years ago, just before the lockdown, and I was visiting some schools, and I wanted to go see what was the what is the level of inclusion, integration, because I was putting together a book on inclusion at that time. And I was editing a book. So I wanted to go see, um, yeah, I had some contributions from people in the US. I just wanted to go and see for myself what's happening like today. And this is what is happening there. It's called inclusion. But the children with the different special needs are then removed and probably are put in a separate classroom within under that same roof or they're taken out of the regular classroom for most of the day they're spending maybe just about 15 to 20 percent of the day in the regular classroom with all other children okay so that's that's not inclusion inclusion is systemic reform okay there is modifications changes to the content to the teaching methods approaches a whole lot of things that need to be done right curriculum assessments expectations guidelines everything needs to really kind of be reconstituted in order to give an inclusive experience to the child right and that is really what is inclusion okay um, integration i believe is another it's just a dilution of you know segregation there's still segregation happening right and when when i when i talk about special schools i understand why they've come about i understand that they still need to be there for children who are severely impaired because otherwise the children won't get their needs satisfied but i say as a society are we segregated do we have different roads different bridges different trains different buses for people with disabilities we know we be using the same systems. We just need to make them more accessible and adaptable, right? So inclusive education is when all students, regardless of any challenges that they may have, are placed in age-appropriate general education classes that are in their own neighborhood schools to receive high quality instruction, interventions, and supports that enable them to meet success in their core curriculum. Core curriculum is your English, your math, maybe your history, your geography, your science, you know, all those is your core curriculum, right? And there are many, many benefits of inclusive education, right? All children are able to become a part of the community. It provides better opportunities for learning for all children. Expectations of all children are higher. Um, you know, it encourages involvement of parents in the education and more than anything. It fosters a culture of respect and belonging to everyone. And when it is in school that all children with or without disabilities learn that they are equal to each other. And if there is someone with something less can be helped, then that culture of helping, culture of responsibility begins very young. Okay, And I think that benefit goes out into society at large. right? And that's what you see. I've seen a lot of that in many of the Scandinavian countries, Finland, Sweden, Iceland, Denmark. You see a lot of it in that because they inculcate it very strongly in childhood, right? Okay, and these are a few things, um, you know, about inclusive education. We'll rush on a little bit because I want to take you to the NEP, right? Okay, so just to give you an idea, uh, these are all the different aspects of, um, you know, the NEP, right? Um, a big part is restructuring school curriculum and pedagogy. And then, of course, 6.1 to 6.20 is equitable and inclusive education, what I'm going to jump to. So first, let's see, you know, what are the key principles of the national education policy? Let's go from 0, 01, right? So if you're going to see 0, 01 is respect for diversity and local context, to be reflected in all curriculum, pedagogy, and policy. And zero two is equity and inclusion to become the cornerstones. Three is community participation. Four is use of technology. 
Five is emphasize conceptual understanding. Six is respect for unique capabilities. And seven is critical thinking and creativity. Eight is continuous review. I'm going to focus on the one and two. Respect for diversity and local context. And second, equity and inclusion. Now, what's of interest to us, you know, in the 6.1 to 6.20 is the fact that NEP 2020 focuses a lot on the socially and economically disadvantaged groups, what are known as the SEDGs, right? The biggest focus is on SEDGs. And what, who are these SEDGs? We'll come to that. But what are some of the, or what are some of the services or the benefits that's going to be made for them? It's a gender inclusion fund, and there's a fund, so to say, for all the other SEDGs, not just gender. Then there's supposed to be social, emotional, and academic counseling, setting up of social, you know, special education zones, providing financial assistance, scholarships, and a mentoring program. You know, this is what the NEP says we should make possible under the framework of the NEP to children with disabilities. So, what are the SEDGs? Okay, we're talking about five SEDGs. One, the gender, your female and transgender. Okay. Two, your social cultural identities, that is your shadow caste, shadow tribes, other backward classes, and the uh, other backward castes and the other minorities. Three, geographical identities, that is students from villages, small towns, aspirational districts. What are aspirational districts? I need you to understand. Aspirational districts are those which are the most developmentally challenged. Okay, that means the various core sectors of health, nutrition, education, agriculture, water, resources, all of this is at a minimum. So they do not have the basic core of a civilized nation. Okay, and they're thus called aspirational districts. Okay, they're most developmentally challenged. Then of course you have the fourth SEDG, that is, uh, you know, the migrant communities, low-income households, etc., due to their socioeconomic status, which is again very, very challenged. Okay. They're also victims or children of victims of trafficking, orphans, including child beggars, etc. And then disabilities. Disabilities, as we today know, the 21 recognized disabilities in the Rights for Persons with Disabilities Act 2016. So these are the five SEDGs that have been recognized in the NAP 2020 and everything that we talk about giving as inclusive and equitable education is for these SEDGs. Okay, I've actually taken the, you know, taken uh, these pictures or graphics out of the HRD, uh, you know, websites and put them here. And um, I'm just going to quickly run through them. I think I have some time. Um, so one of the first things is, like I said, focus on the SEDG. Okay, and we have these five SEDGs, which I've told you about. So I'm going to go to the next page. Okay, what is it that will be done? Separate strategies will be formulated for focused attention for reducing each of the category-wise gaps. So what do we mean by category? So for example, gender identity. We might have fewer girls coming to school than the boys. Why? Okay, so we will be formulating, you know, some focused attention uh, so that we can get more girls to school. It can just simply be that there are no toilets in the school. We need to get that, right? And when we get proper toilets, in which the girls can attend and also probably use during the menstrual periods, you're using, you know, you're, you're, you're putting forth an inclusive strategy, right? So that's, I mean, an example, right? Um, let's say for geographical identities, students from villages, small towns, first of all, how do they get to schools? So can we provide them some modes of transport? That itself will be an inclusive strategy, right? So there are things which have to be done out of the classroom and there are things which have to be done inside the classroom, right? Within SEDGs and with respect to all the above policy points, special attention will be given to reduce the disparities in the educational development. I haven't exactly said why, I mean how, but some points have been put out. Regions of the country with large populations from the educationally disadvantaged SEDGs should be declared special education zones, right? Special education zones because if you've got a lot of people 
who are educationally deprived, then they need they need some more resources. They need some more efforts. Maybe resources in terms of teachers, teaching aides. Something needs to be much more than has been for the others. A gender inclusion fund will be constituted to provide equitable quality education for all girls as well as transgender students. So there's a different financial fund which is going to be put together, a resource fund, okay? And similar inclusion fund schemes will also be uh, developed to address the other SEDGs as far as the access issues are concerned, right? Um, also, the state governments may encourage opening of the NCC wings. There might be free boarding, I and mean, what they're saying is there should be free boarding facilities matching the standards of the uh, the JNVs, that is your Javar, Nabudya Vidyales. Um, there is a Kasturba Gandhi Palika Vidyale, which will be strengthened and expanded to increase the participation in quality schools. Okay, our uh, next page is that additional Kendriya Vidyales and JNVs will be built around the countries especially in the aspirational districts, special education zones, etc. Preschool sections covering at least one year of early childhood care and education will be added to the KVs. Okay. Schools, school complexes will be provided resources for the integration of children with disabilities. So you may have ramps, you may have railings, you may have other teaching aids in the classrooms, um, you may have some smart boards, you may have whatever, so that you know, um, you have special educators, you've got school counselors, whatever, so that, you know, there can be cross-disability training, establishment of resource centers, uh, barrier-free access, okay? One of the first barriers that we see is more in terms of the physical barriers, right? And that we would use um, assistive devices and appropriate technology-based tools, language, you know, appropriate teaching learning materials. Then, the National Institute of Open Schooling, that is your NIOs, they will develop high quality teaching modules. Uh, as for the RPDW Act, children with benchmark disabilities will have the choice of a regular or special school. But then what happens when they go to regular schools? They need teachers with the competencies and the skills. Therefore, knowledge on how to teach, teacher, uh, teach children with specific disabilities will be an integral part of teacher training programs. One-on-one uh, -on -one teachers, educators, peer tutoring, open schooling, technology, all of it is what we are talking about. They're also talking about alternative forms of schools, right? We'll be encouraged to preserve the traditional alternative pedagogical styles. Um, also that, you know, all participants in the school education system, including teachers, principals, administrators, counselors, students, will be sensitized to the requirements of all students. So we're talking here about doing psychoeducation, about inclusion and inclusive education. It would also include more detailed knowledge of various cultures, religions. We need to just sensitize ourselves, become more aware, right? Now, what has also happened is that a lot of major recommendations of the RPWD Act 2016 has been adopted in the NEP 2020. One is equal education opportunities for academics, for sports, etc. Accessible infrastructure, Reasonable accommodation. What does reasonable accommodation mean? That it's a constitutional right that the society has to make possible, the government has to make possible, that there are things that have, you know, there are opportunities that have to be given to people with disabilities or with any of the other SEDGs. And what what is this? Like, for example, if there are dis people with disabilities and they still need to be taken in into the regular jobs, but there have to be accommodations made. Okay, so these are your reasonable, justifiable accommodations which will allow everyone, all citizens, to live in a equitable manner. Then you've got individualized support, supportive services, um, suitable pedagogy, modifications, curriculum, a scribe or a writer, exempt from, from, exemption from second and third languages, monitoring participation and progress, transportation. I don't know if you're aware, but one of the biggest systemic barriers to inclusion is transportation. Imagine a child in a wheelchair, etc. How is this child going to get from home to the school unless there is a transportation facility which can take him on and off his wheelchair or get his wheelchair into the bus? Have you thought about it? 
So transportation is seen to be one of the biggest systemic barriers to children with disabilities attending school, right? Uh, training and employing teachers with disability. So people who have a disability also need to be trained as teachers and taken, you know, taken into the forum, right? Training professionals and staff, establishing resource centers, having augmentative and alternative modes of communication, provision of scholarships, assistive devices, you know, all of this and some, what, a lot of this has been happening before. Now, what are the main barriers to inclusion? You can understand it as, you know, make an acronym out of it, an APO or a POA access, physical access, infrastructure access, attitudinal access, okay? Participation, there are limitations for SEDGs, okay? Like I said, maybe transportation or they can't get into the schools or whatever. And outcomes, there is a discrepancy between the expected and the acceptable learning and social outcomes. So these are some of your biggest barriers to inclusion, okay? Um, and it has to be first addressed at a systemic level. How are we going to address the barriers? Uh, Dr. Shobha, I just need five minutes more. Yeah? Sure, um, sure, ma'am. Sure. Yeah. So how do we address these barriers? One, we build school communities. I believe that school communities can be very good communities for care. Okay? I say schools are community carers. And again, like I said before, it has to be a collaboration, collaboration of all stakeholders to make the school community a community of care, right? So we need to build school communities to address the physical infrastructure and attitudinal barriers. Teacher training, it's the biggest, you know, missing part of the puzzle. We need to get teachers trained. Then we need to adopt the universal design of learning framework. I need you to read more about this to make learning relevant and appropriate to the learner. Use differentiated instruction framework. I spoke to you that we are specifically offering a certificate course in differentiated instruction. Get onto our website, okay? And you will see that we are also offering this in different variants. There's something you'll finish in one hour, which is known as the insight version. Just get a peek into it. You look into the light version, which is a little more in-depth, but you know, without too many assignments and stuff. And then you have the advanced version where you have a lot of, you know, you have um, you have some case studies you can get to read about, you have some assignments to do, etc. Right? So get to know about this with UDL, DI, and then of course we can use competency-based continuous assessment models in order to monitor and support the learning process of each learner. What are some of the challenges and opportunities? Okay. Um, Mainstream schools must enable themselves to include and educate all children. The challenge here will be getting all the infrastructure in place, getting the human resource in place, getting the training in place. But what is the benefit? The benefit is that you would be able to educate all children in the local community. I mean, that's the aim of the NEP 2020, right? And this will involve providing barrier-free access, so whether it's your physical barriers, your infrastructural barriers, your systemic barriers, your attitude barriers, right? And um, enable acceptance of diversity. And again, you you know, read this. Enable acceptance, not just not just recognition, not just acknowledgement, but acceptance. And the diversity can be due to poverty, disability, gender, geography, language, religion, right? and to eliminate social exclusion. You know, the, um, the uh, right to uh, information has put down everything about social inclusion. How can we get all children to study together? But it's just not been executed, right? So we've got fantastic blueprints, but execution is what goes haywire. And so children who should be getting into every other mainstream school are not getting into those schools, right? We need to develop teacher competencies and skills for inclusive education. If we don't do that, then we do not have the right infrastructure. Yeah, We need the human resource infrastructure. We need to develop flexible and relevant curriculum. And we really need to use educational frameworks to enable learning for all. What are these educational frameworks? The universal design for learning. 
the, um, the differentiating instruction. These are the different types of education frameworks that are used to ensure that every child will learn in the classroom. So, what are some research findings? What are some of the benefits of inclusion? One, it improves everyone's health, physical and mental. It minimizes vulnerability. There's improved learning and skill development. There's an improved rate of learning. Uh, friendships, relationships, social networks are larger. There is improved communication and improved behavior. There's greater likelihood of career and employment, obviously, because everyone's being educated together, they have better skills. More comparable life outcomes to people without a disability. So there have been studies and studies which talk about the benefits of inclusion on the people without disability. Okay? How when you also so I you know um we run a lot of these remedial instruction programs in schools. And what we do is that we get students, so peers without disabilities, to mentor their peers with disabilities. That's one group. Second, we might have children of different ages with disabilities, and still we, you know, we, we kind of have the older ones because they have developed certain computers and skills to mentor the younger ones. So we constantly work in, you know, in these dyads, in the triads, and we get the ones who are have more competencies and skills to mentor those with lesser competencies and skills, right? And so it's a win-win situation for everyone. And uh, people with disabilities, of course, they benefit, but so do the others. And finally, one of the biggest thing from the research is that segregation is harmful because it is definitely not the way or the path ahead for a progressive society, right? And so with that, these are some of our references. I would like to introduce you to the book that I've edited. Uh, not just me, it's been an entire team work at Drishti. We, uh, we published this book in 2019, 20, and then we went into a lockdown. But we had a book launch in 2020, and the name of the book is Miss Howard Me. Uh, that's actually the title of one of the very interesting stories. So this book on inclusion is a collection of 40 different articles, mostly all told in story format. Okay, And these are stories that have come from all stakeholders, from students themselves, from parents, from teachers, from school principals, from therapists, from psychiatrists, and from government officials. So we have a contributor who is one of the directors at the Central Board of Secondary Education. We have one who is a director at the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment. We, I have a few contributors from the US, some from UK, and of course, you know, all across our country. And which is why it's almost like, a, it, it's, it's like a collection of case studies. And the way I put it in, what my role at, as editor has been, is not only, of course, to be able to put these all together, but at the end of every story, or the end of every article, I've analyzed the whole thing and given different pointers on what you need and what you, know, what you need to ask, what you need to take away, and what is it that you want to learn from this. So everything's being put down in a very standardized format. It's available on Amazon in hard copies as well as the Kindle edition, but I would recommend this, and this has been an endeavor, so that we can put together stories and inclusion that's happening in our country, right? I think that's really important. It's important to recognize the efforts and the outcomes of the foot soldiers of inclusion in our country. So thank you so much for uh, you know being here, listening to me, taking your time out, Again, um, a very big thanks to all the uh, all the members of PN Doshi uh, College for inviting me here today. So, um, Shobha, I'm I'm done with this. And thank you can, so much, ma'am. Yeah. We were attentive from the word go. <laughs> it was wonderful session. Uh, your thank session you. really provided you know clarity on the basic concepts, which began with equity, equality, and justice. And uh, an understanding of these concepts helped us understand the, the premise on which we should provide 
environments that are inclusive and just. You, you, you also talked about equitable classrooms where the important elements were highlighted for effective teaching learning. Ma'am, uh, all the hands-on experiences, I mean, your activities really kept us engaged and interested <laughs> Thank you. every minute. Uh, finally, the strategies highlighted in NEP for inclusion and the challenges and opportunities for uh, to be inclusive really gave us wonderful insights which we can take back with us and uh, you know we can use to create better insights for our children and i hope uh, you know we will be able to practice this it really was a very very wonderful session for me also a lot of learning and uh, the ending was cherry on the cake because <laughs> we definitely would like to uh, have you know get our hands on the book and i'm Thank possibly you. going to get it immediately and i'm sure the principal would like to get it for our library because uh, when we learn through real life stories it yes. becomes so much more meaningful and makes us believe in in uh, what we are practicing and will also inspire us to take actions and dr shobha this is these are stories which have actually been written by them then of course edited a bit and whatever but it's not something that i have written these are stories which are coming from these people yes. right so whether they're parents so or whatever so i think that would be great if you know you can get yes, one for the library yes yes really definitely ma'am and we would sure. get more copies for our students because we have two batches with many many students sure. so definitely thank you so much ma'am absolutely Truly grateful thank for you. the wonderful session we'll now thank move on to the much. question answer session over to Ritu. Uh, yes, thank you so much, uh, ma'am, for your wonderful session. We have no words, actually. We are short of words to thank you. Thank uh, you, Dr. Ritu. Thank you very thank much. You. Uh, there are a few questions uh, yeah. from the students. Uh, can yes. I take, ma'am? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, one question is like uh, uh, Agargi Kulkarni. She wants to know, like, what is the uh, method of scribe because many times okay. it is seen that this someone is taking advantage of these children like uh, unfair advantage uh, is being taken uh, like the because the scribes would write most of the answers for the special students with their own knowledge what can we do to ensure that no one takes advantage of the scribe system and what right. we can do to erase such misconceptions from the academic settings because learning disability particularly the children they are taking the advantage uh, they are taking the benefit of this so what we can do to ensure that uh, these students are not cheated or no one takes advantage of them okay so i think like anywhere else um there are protocols in place you know so it depends upon which uh, board the child education board the child is a part of Garki. Uh, whether it's the state board or whether it is, you know, the CBSC or the ICC, whatever. With reference to, let me just take an example of the CBSC. The CBSC has, you know, a circular which keeps getting updated now and then. And it has all its, you know, criteria and points laid down very clearly in their circular, which will tell you what kind, you know, like what are all the criteria that a person who has to be a scribe has to fulfill. So the child actually has to be a couple of classes younger, right? So if it's a 10th grader who needs a scribe, the scribe has to be not older than the ninth grade, has to be approved by the head of the school, has to have certain achievement criteria, has to have fulfilled, you know, about three classes of practice with the person who's going to give the exam etc etc now how can we ensure that this happens it is the responsibility of the head of the school to ensure that these criteria are met because finally the examination is taking place within the school environment so it is also the role very important role of the head of the school to ensure that these benefits that are being given are being correctly executed and are not being corrupted in any Yes, ma'am. Very rightly said by you, ma'am. Can I take second question? Yes. Yeah. So the second question is about uh, how we develop the sensitivity in the 
normal children like those who have no disability uh, about these children who have special needs because many times in the inclusive classrooms this is a challenge for the teacher absolutely the biggest challenge absolutely so i would say that when we want to begin with building the sensitivity of the children we first need to start with sensitivity and inclusive education training for the teachers okay so it has to be the adults who are the main caretakers and owners of responsibility we need to first get all the adults in the school system to be trained for inclusion and that's a lot of the work that you know me and my organization have been engaged in, in the last i would say a decade okay we do a lot of inclusive education training in fact i used to you know while the offline things were still going on i was a master trainer for the cbsc on doing exactly this okay let's train the teachers let's train the school and once the teachers are trained the teachers are then trained on how to you know create an inclusive classroom and that means a lot of things it means like i said something like your peer mentoring there has to be a lot of psycho education going on for the children it means giving them responsibility so just in very brief let me tell you one of the first schools that i worked with which was by the name of learners academy in mumbai um at that point there were uh, the head of the school was mrs kaliwala one of the most progressive educators i've ever met she's of course no more and that was a school where children were trained you know in terms of sensitivity for inclusion right from kindergarten right so what would happen is children with disabilities were paired with children with no disability and the responsibility for uh friendship support everything was kind of rotated amongst all the children so a child with disability was placed with different peers every week okay so children were rotated around in the classroom and very early on that culture of help friendship and support was built up in that school so that's just an example that you can take back that's very important madam actually uh the third question which we take is uh, about the gifted children like uh, we always think that inclusive classrooms are only for the people those who have some disability but what yeah. about the gifted how you can include them in the regular classroom or what we can we do right very nice question and in fact comes in at at that point when i'm talking about my role at learners academy school where i worked as a school counselor come special educator all rolled into one right and in fact we used to have a program there for gifted learners okay and these were the children who were academically very very bright and in fact used to find the regular classroom you know everything happening a little boring so they wanted something more and again we would do we would use the you know in a way the same methodology uh but we would flip it around where the children with disability required the support from the different children we would use these gifted learners and train them to be mentors for the other children in the classroom right so they would be using the best of their cognitive abilities to support other children who may not be with just disabilities but just other children we would allow them not only to be mentors but we would also allow them to address classrooms as you know like peer helpers peer mentors so they would actually take classrooms they would teach parts of the curriculum to the classroom okay that was one thing and after school there would be also programs for the gifted learners where there would be a lot of stimulating activities given to them whereby they could also go back home and these stimulating activities would span across humanities sciences arts music etc so these are some of the things that I know I have done found it to be very very useful and can be thank you madam uh there's one question like uh, is can we can take uh, two or three questions right shobha sure. yes yeah so uh, yeah so there is a question about the extra curricular activities in the inclusive classroom because ki kya physically inclusive ho gaye academically bhi humne unko bada diya but what about the sports what about the other activities because right. 
sometimes it happens that in in the inclusive classroom the uh, special needs children they feel neglected when the children are going out for sport activity hmm. so what about that ma'am yeah so i think first there has to be a clear conceptual understanding um and you must understand that you know there are three terms impairment disability and handicap yes. every impairment doesn't cause a disability every disability does not pose a handicap okay so that me what do i mean by that i may have a learning disability but does that affect my performance on the football ground no a learning disability is affecting my performance or posing a handicap or a disadvantage in the classroom so who are the children there are you know when when there are children with special education needs they may be having these special education needs only in the classroom in fact they may be having some of their strengths as far as the extracurriculars are concerned so there might be those children who are very good at music on the sports ground in art we need to explore what their strengths are now which are the children who are going to have difficulties with the physical sports you will have children with visual impairments you will have children with orthopedic impairments that's motor impairments who are going to have difficulties on the sports ground and when that is so you need to compensate by trying to find out if they are good at music if they are good at art and in fact compensate in that manner okay on the other hand there might be those children with motor impairments or orthopedic impairments where only the lower limbs have been affected but the upper limbs may be fine so how about finding something by which they can even play a sport with their upper hands upper limbs right there might be children who have upper and lower limb disability but they can still swim okay so take them into the water so the most important thing is to be able to explore and understand what are their different capacities you don't just use a disability as a blanket prognosis and say hey this child can't do anything no every child if if there's a functional assessment done a functional understanding you will see that we understand that each one of them will be able to do something on the playground something in art something in music yes yes ma'am uh there's a last question uh, we can take that uh, the inclusion should begin from home uh, what are your views on that because many time it is seen that the parents they don't accept the reality the fact that their child has a special need in particularly in the large families or in extended families yes. the special needs children they are given a third grade treatment yeah. they are neglected they are not yeah. invited in the birthday parties or when even if they are invited nobody talks to them so how we can change this attitude right how we can change this thing ma'am right right i think everyone you know i i don't know how many of this generation of college students but if you haven't seen it do see the movie tare zameen par it's not that you know oh it's going to give us all the answers and all but it it did a very good job in terms of raising awareness right and that tells us the situation at home right in the beginning of my presentation i had said that respect for diversity begins at home right and for that just because you know to respect diversity you don't have to have a disability there's diversity of thought how much can we respect this difference in opinion i think that is what must begin at home and if we respect that we all look different we speak different we sound different and therefore our abilities may be different it's as simple as that you know difference is not bad right it's it is the it is the rule and the law that we are all different i mean we may be all women but we are all of different shapes sizes colors whatever does that make us good or bad no that is the mindset you know dr ritu it's the mindset which we need to change and i think that as far as abilities disabilities go we need to have a lot of parent education beginning right from when children are in preschool because unfortunately we can't go into every home but at least school as a community as a community carer can 
certainly begin parent education programs right from when the children are in preschool. So I think that's that's definitely a role that the school community can play. Um, Ma'am, I teach special needs children this paper for the, okay. both the BA and BSc level. And many times uh, when we, because the government has not given us the term, uh, they have given us this term Divyang. So yes. what exactly this term is all about? Like uh, we teach them, we explain to them, but many times the question is like, why this term has come up, Divyang? I know, I know. Um, See, I always say that, you know, when a particular term, a concept, whatever is being used, it's going to have both its pros and cons, right? Um, we might say disability also, is that a good term? Why are we saying disability? We must say different abilities, okay? Very often certain terms, certain labels come up because they might be also service oriented, right? children will get certain services, certain benefits, etc. So I would say rather than debating and discussing too much about the term, I think let's look into what, what we can do, what steps can each one of us take as an individual and as a collective to make inclusion possible. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. So uh, we wind up this session. Yes. And we are very thankful to you, ma'am. Thank and you. Over to you, Sho, Dr. Shobha Bharat. Can we just start the vote of thanks? Directly? Yes, please. Yes, yeah. yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I formally give the vote of thanks to you, ma'am. On behalf of IQSC and Department of Human Development of Srimati P.N. Doshi Women's College, we, Human Development Team members, Dr. Shobha Bharat, the HOD, and myself, express our sincere thanks to all the participants present here for today's national level webinar on Vision NEP 2020, Outlining Horizons for Equitable and Inclusive Education. We are always grateful to our honorable trustee, and Managing Director of SPRJ Kanyashala Trust, Ms. Meena Khetani, Madam, for her constant encouragement for all the endeavors at department level. We are thankful to our Director, Madam, Dr. S. Kumudavali, for her good wishes and motivation to conduct all events. Next, we are extremely thankful to our Principal, Madam, Dr. Asha Manan, who is an inspiring force for us to take up new events and to conduct various activities. She always encourages us, guides us, directs us in the department so that we excel in all our efforts. Since Dr. Asha Manan, Madam, belongs to human development area with her expertise in the field, we always learn from her. We express our attitude, uh, gratitude towards her for her constant support and sparing time for today's webinar. Further, we express our sincere thanks to our Vice Principal, Madam, Dr. Rekha Randev, Ma'am, for her support and wishes for today's event. Next, most importantly, we express our heartfelt thanks to our wonderful resource person, Dr. Smita Desai, Madam, the founder of Drishti Foundation, for giving us a wonderful insight into the topic NEP 2020. You explained everything so well, ma'am, your approach and everything is so good. I have no words to thank you. Thanks a lot, madam, for giving us your time from your busy schedule. Thanks a lot. I would also like to thank Dr. Asha, Dr. Ritu, Dr. Rekha, and Dr. Shobha. It's really been a wonderful um, evening, and I do hope that I can be of help to you in any work that you wish to do regarding inclusion. Thank, thank you so, so much. so much, ma'am. That's, that's just a wonderful gift. Thank you so much. We will I approach you. Now I will take you on that. Thank you. <laughs> Asha, yeah. thank you so much Let's... for a wonderful session, ma'am was uh, really very educative i would say for all the participants to know your viewpoint and maybe you know uh, when we deal with students in our class we'll be a little more careful to see that it is inclusive and we talk about activities that they also would be able to do and we could, we could achieve a lot together then thank you uh, i conclude by thanking all the participants present here uh, they have uh, joined us from various parts of the India, like seven states, 
we have counted so far so uh, the huge participation and uh, we are thankful to the our technical team members ms hashmat khan for her technical support and i don't forget the help which is given by ms vishakha bharaskar our tv student for designing the webinar brochure she just passed uh, the tv and she is now uh, taking admission in some other college but we are very thankful to you vishakha for all your help so i conclude here by expressing our gratitude to almighty god for its smooth conduction of today's event with this i thanks everyone stay safe stay healthy thank, thank you and have a good evening bye bye thank, thank you, you so much